This is the KJ Show. The KJ Show with host Dr. Katherine Johnson is a mix of breaking news and practical advice on the many ways which the energy industry can affect you and your family. Catherine will combine energy updates and conversations with leaders in the energy efficiency community. So please welcome your host, Dr. KJ. Hello and welcome to the KJ Show. I'm Dr. Katherine Johnson, your host on the Bull Brave TV network. And today we're talking about blowing in the wind. Is the answer wind power? Really, probably not. It's maybe one of the answers, but not generally the only answer out there. So today we're going to talk about wind turbines and wind, all kinds of things wind related. And I have an update on some beavers too at the end of the show. But first I wanted to talk about stuff that you just can't make up. I have to say this is one of my favorite parts of the show. And every week I just end up being even more surprised. So the first thing is, I've talked about this in a previous show about heating versus eating and the whole issue of whether or not we're supposed to eat meat. And the climate activists out there are telling us we shouldn't eat meat because cows are bad for the planet. Well, guess what the Dutch have done? The ads are now banning Holland in certain cities like Harlem are actually banning ads for meat products just like they're banning ads for aviation fuels and fossil fuels, all as part of an attempt to get what? reduce meat consumption because it's climate damaging. Um, they, they actually, the city actually said, the council said they passed a bill two years ago that said that they want to be consistent and have a moral uh, prerogative and a moral imperative to make sure that they don't encourage eating of meat because it's just not good for the environment. And so they thought if they took ads for public in public spaces like on buses and in public squares advertising, I don't know, meat products, that would be considered immoral. So they've decided to ban this. And this is the first time in the world that a company is actually banning ads for meat. What will they think of next? And more fundamentally, um, Holland has, is going to be in the news a little bit later because you can't talk about wind power without, of course, talking about Holland. But I thought that was kind of an interesting thing that they're actually now banning meat ads. I wonder where else it'll happen. And then this is funny. Um, I always like talking about EVs and apparently my listeners and viewers do too, because I get a lot of views on those shows, but an EV, it was an Uber driver's EV and it's a hybrid and it's this source of his income for his family. So it's very important that his EV works, right? Guess what? His EV was destroyed by rats. They ate it. Apparently deep in the entrails of his Sansi's Kia, E, uh, an electric crossover car was gnawed away by rats, big chunks of wiring and causing more than 5,000 pounds, which is about $7,500 in damage that neither the car's warranty nor the manufacturer will cover. Insurance won't cover it either. So now this guy has lost, has $7,500 worth of damage because the wiring was eaten by rats. And the reason it was is because it apparently is made out of interesting tasting materials to rats. Uh, The Kia France, this has happened in France, said that the company sympathizes, but he probably had crumbs in his car and maybe that's why the rats attacked it. But other people are like, no, no, this is an issue that apparently is well known in the electric vehicle community. In fact, Tesla actually is now has forums about customers who are complaining because rodents are eating their interior of their car. Um, because they have, guess what, soy-based insulation, which is food. So here in our attempt to create environmentally friendly products out of biodegradable things like soy, guess what? Rats like it too. And I don't think anybody in the car business ever really considered the fact that electric vehicles would be considered a good dinner item for uh, rats. In fact, the, the, one of the quotes in the article that made me laugh was, the rodents made a picnic out of our Kia. Um, I don't see that happening in any electric vehicle ad anytime soon. And there's so many other questions that we find about electric vehicles, so many other concerns that have been rising about electric vehicles. Here's yet another one. Your car may be attacked by rodents. 
And then since we're talking about wind, I had to go through a little bit of a, you know, a, a gut check. And the Biden administration has really been promoting wind. I mean, they said it's transformative. It's going to be, uh, you know, want a sustainable wind strategy that has, we're leveraging all of our key resources to harness the clean and reliable American energy source. Um, they want to, you know, drive down carbon emissions. I mean, this is a key part of the new IRA bill, right? Guess what? They also held a offshore fossil fuel oil leases the same day they are actually promoting wind power. So you kind of wonder how, how committed Biden is to wind power if they're also selling leases for land in, Af in, in Alaska, uh, offshore leases in, in Alaska. Um, the Biden campaign ended to, to, you know, campaign to end all of these fossil fuel leases, except he's still offering them at auction. Now, some of the auctions haven't been very successful, but he's still pushing it. So I think that's a tad bit hypocritical, maybe just a little. So um, they said that earlier the month, the administration approved the Willow direct drilling pipe project, which of course is huge, a big pipeline that's going to actually take um, oil and gas to Asia. But they said they offered up nearly a million Africa, Alaskan offshore acres for fossil fuels. But we're promoting wind energy because that's the transformative solution that we need. But is it really? And actually it isn't. And that's what we're going to talk about more in the show. But one of the things I found when I was doing my research for this show was that actually using wind power increases the usage of fossil fuels. And this is a conundrum, but I'll explain it. Apparently wind power is really cheap when it's generated right there. But the problem is when you have to transport the electricity over miles and miles to where people actually need it, because wind power is often in remote, rural, offshore locations where people don't, aren't living, then by the time they have to generate the fuel to transport the electricity that generated by the wind power, the costs actually become much more expensive. Wind turbines are really powerful in the sea and where the wind blows, um, but the offshore turbines have up to 10,000 kilowatts and are expected to reach 15,000 kilowatts, which is a lot, let me tell you. But a single turbine can satisfy electricity for like 4,000 people, 40,000 people in Germany. But the complexity and the cost of laying down the power cables on the seabed and then the transporting the fuels means that the electric, the cost to electricity they generate is, is twice as expensive from turbines than on land. So nevertheless, offshore wind farms in densely population mm -hmm. areas might make sense, but no one really <laughs> thought about the chance generate of carrying that electricity obviously it's time for a break you're on the bold brave tv network i'm dr katherine johnson your host and we'll be right back and maybe my dog will stop barking what if there were a super tiny device that could diagnose the brain and is smaller than a single human hair what if you could see inside the brain to help an epilepsy patient during surgery or to help the fight against parkinson's disease Dr. Patricia Broderick is proud to announce the Broderick Probe, a biomedical and electronic breakthrough. Imagine a probe to help with the understanding and potential cure of brain-related diseases. To learn more, listen live to the Easy Sense Radio Show with host Dr. Broderick, Wednesdays, 7 p.m. Eastern, on the Bold Brave Media Network and TuneIn Radio. And to help support the Broderick Foundation, please go to Easy easysense.com and learn how with your help we can fight these horrific brain disorders that's easysense.com to learn more and help support the broderick foundation author radio show host and coach john m hawkins reveals strategies to help gain perspective build confidence find clarity achieve goals john m hawkins new book Coached to Greatness, unlock your full potential with limitless growth. Published by iUniverse, Hawkins reveals strategies to help readers accomplish more. He believes the book can coach them to greatness. Hawkins says that the best athletes get to the top of their sport with the help of coaches, mentors, and others. He shares guidance that helps readers reflect on what motivates them. 
Rediscover and assess their core values, philosophies, and competencies. Find settings that allow them to be the most productive and track their progress towards accomplishing goals. Listen to John Hawkins' My Strategy, Saturdays, 1 p.m. Eastern, on the BBM Global Network and TuneIn Radio. And welcome back to the KJ Show. I'm Dr. Katherine Johnson, your host on the Bull Brave TV Network. And today I'm talking about wind power and wind turbines. Is the answer blowing in the wind, that old Bob Dylan song? Actually, not so fast, not so much. So first of all, I wanted to sort of understand or go through some of the basics of wind power. And, you know, I'm wondering, is it wind power or is it just hot air? And the answer is there is some wood term, you know, good advantages about wind turbines. And wind actually is created by the sun. Um, a wind turbines work to create, you know, on simple principles, instead of using, instead of being a fan, they're actually generating electricity, these big rotor blades that turn that look like, frankly, airplane propellers. And the, tar- the wind turns the propeller blades around a rotor, which then generates the electricity. And it's fairly simple, except when they're built too tall and they fall down. But it's a form of solar energy caused by the sun's he- unevenly heating the atmosphere, irregularities of the Earth's surface, and also the rotation of the Earth. So wind is something that occurs naturally. Um, and wind flows and speeds and patterns vary across the United States. The Colorado prairie, I mean, the prairies and the Rocky Mountain areas has a lot of wind. Other areas, not so much. Um, but right now, there's been about 3,000 wind turbines have been built in the United States across uh, since 2005. And the United States Inform- Energy Information Agency, or EIA, actually says that the average home uses 893 kilowatt hours per month which could actually be generated according to the um, DOE's expert, expert, expert estimates that they could actually generate 843 kilowatt, thousand kilowatt hours per month, enough to power 940 homes. Sounds good. Um, the wind power turbine came online in 2020, generates electricity in 46 minutes to power the average home for a month. So this sounds really good, right? We have wind power, it's free, it's coming through, it can generate homes for, you know, electricity for 900 homes, or, you know, they can do it really fast. Um, So those all sound like really good ideas. And harnessing the wind does have some environmental advantages. It's free, which is always good. Uh, We don't have to go to war over it. Nobody has the control yet of the wind. And they are run on strictly with the power of the wind generated. So there's, they say there's no need for the fuel alternative fuels. However, that's not quite so true. And once a turbine is complete, it says it's basically up and running and it reduces, you know, the overall cost because it's supposed to run for a long time. It's also clean because obviously it doesn't emit fossil fuels. And so that's a good thing. And they also think that the latest advances in wind technology will actually make it even better and more efficient. And as technology improves, so will the functionality of it. However, there's also um, some other advantages. It doesn't disrupt farmland operations, so it's actually been a good economic boon for farmers who rent out part of their land to have wind turbines installed on their properties, and less than 1.5% of the land area is used by wind plants, which means they're not taking up a huge solar solar footprint, kind of like solar farms take up a lot of space. Wind turbines don't. Um, And as long as the sun heats the planet, there'll be an endless supply of wind. Good, except now let's look between, a little behind those numbers. And as again, I used to be a journalist, so I never just take things at face value. And so I dug a little deeper, and this is what I've discovered. First of all, uh, wind turbines, as we all know, are dangerous to wildlife. In fact, the wind turbines at the Straits of Gibraltar are actually turned off when birds are migrating during certain seasonal periods. I was there in Gibraltar and I learned all about how they have all these really important migratory routes for all these very rare and I mean basically most of the birds come from Africa through through Gibraltar back to Europe and the United States and, and everywhere else. So Gibraltar's like the crossing zones for birds. And so they actually turn off their windmills, their wind turbines during the migratory season and rely on other things for generating electricity, which to me sounds like a good solution. However, they've also not every country or jurisdiction has that philosophy and unfortunately they've known that they have killed birds they also kill bats tree bats the wind turbines they think 
the tree bats get confused when they're not spinning and they think they're trees and then they fly into them and they get killed and they find tens of thousands of dead bats. Now bats aren't my favorite creature, but they are an important creature to our ecosystem and the fact that they're being killed is terrible by something man-made, right? I mean, if it was a tree, they wouldn't be killed, but the wind turbine is causing environmental damage. Um, the wildlife on the ground may also be affected by the whirring blades and the noise pollution. Also, when a turbine falls down, the wind turbine falls down, it's been known to decapitate cows. Um, other problems is, another problem is that they found out that, um, that beneath the turbines, these also affecting the birds. Um, and off, certainly offshore, we've had concerns about, you know, I've heard about beaching whales and wild uh, fish being ups, you know, upset and migratory patterns being upset because the wind turbine either on the ground or in the sea creates vibrations that confuse dolphins and confuse whales. So it's not quite as environmentally friendly as one would like you to believe um, that there are more three quarters of the bat fatalities are at wind turbines from species known as tree bats and they are also um, unfortunately being killed off. So I don't know where the environmentalists stand. Is it all right to kill birds and bats? Um, I don't think so. Um, and another advantage of it, the disadvantage of wind turbines is that it's actually noisy. And this is something that, you know, we've heard people complain about. The cows don't like it apparently. And they're very noisy. They're, that's why they're found in only rural areas. Yeah, let's have the rural farmers take the burden of the noise and, you know, why bother it with the busy, noisy American suburbs and cities, right? We can't put wind power there, wind turbines there. Um, they have developed some newer designs to make it a little less noisy, but there's also some problems with that. Lastly, it is expensive up front. Um, you know, it's not, it's not easy to build these propeller blades and make them strong enough to generate wind. And they said the further ground Further, in rural areas, it costs a lot of money because there's not an infrastructure in place, so they have to lay the cables and they have to connect it to the grid, and that's all very expensive. But lastly, and probably the most important part that's really concerning to me is it's unpredictable. It's intermittent. It's what the uh, same problem we have with solar. Wind turbines work great when the wind is blowing. Um, when we were in France, we saw a lot of wind turbines across the beautiful you know, countryside of France. But a lot of them weren't turning on and a lot of them weren't working because the wind wasn't blowing or the French EDF, Electricité de France, didn't need the power because they're 97% nuclear. Uh, so that can cause what is called intermittency, which is something that electrical engineers really don't like because it means it's unreliable and the cities don't have, and unless you can figure out a way to do energy storage, which is a whole nother thing, then maybe it isn't such a great idea. And then, um, the last thing is Scotland, which claims it has all these wind turbines. They've actually been using diesel generators to supply the wind power because the wind turbines don't actually work as reliably as they want. So they've been using diesel fuel to power the wind turbines in Scotland for years. So big scandal. Um, this is an interesting thing. There's a lot about wind we don't really know about yet, but there's this push for it. Um, don't let the facts get in the way, right? Um, I'm Dr. Katherine Johnson. You're on the Bold Brave TV network. Uh, you're watching The KJ Show, and we'll be right back. Did you know that your beliefs create your entire reality, but it's the subconscious beliefs that do most of the creating? Belief Shifter and Life Coach Shiraz can help you identify those limiting beliefs and eliminate them, often in a single session. Like, it was almost instant. Like, I had relief right away creating better health relationships careers and finances let shiraz help you step out of safety and into awareness definitely something's happening uh it's like a, a flow inside you know it feels good whether in person or online shiraz provides personal coaching belief shifting visit shiraz at energeticmagic.com or call 416-529-7429 energetic magic on the BBM Global Network, Tuesdays at 7 p.m. Eastern. Find your greater happiness. Be well. Be aware. Be magical. Are you struggling to care for elderly parents or a spouse? Do you wonder if being a caregiver is making you sick? Are you worried about taking time off work to care for elderly parents and balance work, life, and caregiving? 
Has caregiving become exhausting and emotionally draining? Are you an aging adult who wants to remain independent, but you're not sure how? I'm Pamela D. Wilson. Join me for the Caring Generation radio show for caregivers and aging adults, Wednesday evenings, 6 Pacific, 7 Mountain, 8 Central, and 9 Eastern, where I answer these questions and share tips for managing stress, family relationships, health, well-being, and more. Podcasts and transcripts of The Caring Generation are on my website, PamelaDWilson.com, plus my caregiving library, online caregiver support programs, and programs for corporations interested in supporting working caregivers. Help, hope, and support for caregivers is here on The Caring Generation and PamelaDWilson.com. And welcome back to the KJ Show. I'm Dr. Katherine Johnson, your host on the Bold Brave TV Network. Today I've been talking about blowing in the wind wind turbines and whether they're actually making sense as part of our clean energy renewable strategy. I think they have to be part of the common uh, part of the equation, but they certainly not, are not the answer to all of our green energy crises. Uh, before we went to the break, I was talking about how wind power actually is has intermittency problems. And in Scotland, it was a big scandal I just discovered where they've been having to, even though Scotland is lauding itself as having one of the best wind power, you know, generation and they're, you know, 40% of their electricity is generated by wind, a whistleblower came out and the first story was first broken about three or four years ago. And now a new story has come out where they're actually admitting that they've been having to use diesel fuel to power the wind turbines about uh, uh, under 50 mar under 50 megawatts because they need to provide insurance to make sure that the lights actually stay on when the wind doesn't blow. So instead of being this environmental option of getting rid of, you know, dirty fossil fuels, what are they using? The wind powers? They're fueling it with diesel fuel. Again, this is stuff that you just can't make up. And it sort of shows you that perhaps the world isn't quite ready for uh, an economy or a, a grid powered exclusively or in, in conjunction with just wind and solar. And there's been a lot of pushback in Europe too. There's this whole NIMBY, not in my backyard uh, view, where a lot of places are actually saying, no, 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 we like global warming. We believe that global warming is happening. We want to do the things we should do, but you're not going to put a wind turbine in my backyard. Martha Vineyard did it. They didn't, they said it was ugly and it would kill birds. They don't have one, even though blow, wind blows quite nicely over that cape. Um, so as green energy policies are being rolled out worldwide, there's a lot of political pushback. In Australia, there are plans to, there were plans to cluster wind and solar projects and renewable energy zones, but now the towns around those towns, those, some of those towns are saying, no, 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 we don't want that in our community. Uh, they just don't like the public opinion is against them. They're like, no, we don't want it. We can have it somewhere else. We're all for wind and solar, but not in our backyard. Um, and the Danish, who are also pretty environmentally conscious and certainly on the forefront, and they have a lot of wind turbines offshore, they actually have one of their biggest stakeholders is now pulling out of its wind farm that it was going to build in 2004 because it costs too much. The capacity, they said, to have a capacity of 700 megawatts would require over a billion dollars and they would have to have up to 119 turbines. It's just not an economic venture. And so Dan, 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 Denmark is pulling out of it. And even though um, people are, you know, in Denmark, very con concerned about making sure we push away from fossil fuels, even they have a cost and a limit on how much they will spend on this. Holland is actually can canceling wind turbines. I mean, I read this and I'm like, but Holland, you know, we've seen all those pictures, of those beautiful windmills and the, every little town has them with the tulips and the, t you know, that's pretty much Holland's vision, right? They're all for windmills, except not wind turbines, not in the They actually had a huge demonstration where this is from Holland, where these women are saying no to wind turbines. They don't want them. Windmills are one thing. They aren't as dangerous and, as, and, and noisy, but Holland without, we'd think they'd be one of the leading proponents, right? Of wind power? Absolutely not. There are proposed wind farms that have, are estimated one-fifth of the Dutch municipalities have been negatively affected due to a local support and dozens are being canceled or delayed. So even though Holland has a proven history of wind and using wind to, you know, do their windmills, they don't want to put in wind turbines because it's too noisy. Swedes are also against it, as are uh, Germans. 
and several wind operators in Germany are pro battling against protesters in court because uh, they're having to have the developmental, you know, people are protesting. This reminds me a lot of when nuclear power plants were being proposed and people didn't want to put them in their backyards. So the answer is, where are we going to put them? And do, you know, I never thought of wind turbines as quite as controversial as nuclear, but apparently in Holland and Germany and Sweden, they are. And then this is something that's even closer to home. Eversource, which is a utility company in Connecticut, has been investing in wind projects for several years. And Connecticut is relying on this wind power to actually help them move to a clean, green future. <laughs> Connecticut's been a leader in wind power for, well, a leader in green energy, promoting green energy for a long time, as has, has most of uh, New England. And they are announced on Thursday, though, in uh, May 23rd, on uh, May 25th, Eversource Energy announced that they were going to sell the company that they had invested in their 50% ownership stake in a wind turbine operation, a 175,000 acres ton of which a wind farm was going to be developed and located 25 miles off the south coast of Massachusetts. They're pulling out because it's too expensive. Uh, the company sold its ownership stake for $625 million to a joint venture pro partner, um, with a and then this is a Danish partner, so we'll see how the Danish partner ends up faring now that the Dan Danes are also pulling out of wind power. And the company's decision and whether or not to build this, what they call the revolutionary revolution wind project, is whether actually it's ever built because it was going to be two wind farms in the southern New England coast. Guess what? They thought it was going to generate electricity for Connecticut, but now they don't think it's going to actually happen because. The, the other wind farm, which is Parks City Wind Farm in, in um, another part of Connecticut, was in the midst of trying to change the terms of its deal with its offshore wind contract in Connecticut. So when you actually start getting into the basics, the economics of wind power, the concern is that maybe it just doesn't make sense economically. I mean, you know, there's the other reasons to do things. Of course, clean, clean energy shouldn't always just be an economic consideration, but face it, we live in a capitalist society and economics do govern all these business investments and utilities, even though they're regulated, do have to make sure that they're making sound economic decisions. Well, apparently Connecticut was counting on both of these projects to meet the goals and the requirements that they have, they're supposed to cut carbon emissions by 2040. But now if they don't have those two wind power projects completed, they don't know how they're gonna do it. Um, so because they wanted to use it to replace the nuclear power station, which supplies a quarter of New England's electricity with wind power. But I don't think they're going to be able to do that if the wind power farms are no longer operational. Certainly, it's an interesting twist, right? So um, all of a sudden, Connecticut was in wind power, all in, and now they diverse, diversified themselves, divested of that atmosphere of that asset. And we may be going back to nuclear. Hmm. The answer is definitely not in wind. All right. I'm Dr. Katherine Johnson, your host You're on the Bold Brave TV network. You've been watching the KJ Show. We'll be right back. What if there were a super tiny device that could diagnose the brain and is smaller than a single human hair? What if you could see inside the brain to help an epilepsy patient during surgery or to help the fight against Parkinson's disease? Dr. Patricia Broderick is proud to announce the Broderick Probe, a biomedical and electronic breakthrough. Imagine a probe to help with the understanding and potential cure of brain-related diseases. To learn more, listen live to the Easy Sense Radio Show with host Dr. Broderick, Wednesdays, 7 p.m. Eastern, on the Bold Brave Media Network and TuneIn Radio. And to help support the Broderick Foundation, please go to Easy sense.com and learn how with your help we can fight these horrific brain disorders that's easysense.com to learn more and help support the broderick foundation author radio show host and coach john m hawkins reveals strategies to help gain perspective build confidence find clarity achieve goals john m hawkins new book Coached to Greatness, unlock your full potential with limitless growth. Published by iUniverse, Hawkins reveals strategies to help readers accomplish more. He believes the book can coach them to greatness.
Hawkins says that the best athletes get to the top of their sport with the help of coaches, mentors, and others. He shares guidance that helps readers reflect on what motivates them. We discover and assess their core values, philosophies, and competencies, find settings that allow them to be the most productive, and track their progress towards accomplishing goals. Listen to John Hawkins' My Strategy, Saturdays, 1 p.m. Eastern, on the BBM Global Network and TuneIn Radio. Hey, and welcome back to the KJ Show. You're on. I'm on the Bold Brave TV Network. You're watching uh i'm dr katherine johnson your host it is time for you to call in and join the conversation about when the numbers on the screen 866-451-1451 we'd love to hear from you and anyone else and i really think it's always interesting to talk about these topics because wind power is one of those things that people just sort of say oh yeah yeah absolutely it's gonna be it's gonna be perfect it's a great solution and then when you start digging into it not so fast uh, while we're waiting for callers um i wanted to say that I can't stop looking at some of the crazy European news that comes down out of the pike. And now Spain has made history by actually giving personhood status to a salt waters lagoon because of 600 citizens in Barcelona area wanted to protect it. So they granted personhood status to the largest salt, salt water c- c- lagoon. Um, it suffered from lots of massive die-offs of marine life due to degradation by coastal development. So it was basically being harmed by local farming and development. So they had a new law that says now it has to be better protection and 60,000 citizens backed the initiative. And so now this 1600 square kilometer lagoon will officially be legally represented by caretakers that made up of local officials, citizens and other scientists. We're granting personhood to lagoons. New Zealand did this <laughs> in. Um, Hello. In, uh, hey, hey, hi. How are you? Hi, John. How are you? Hi, hi, Catherine. Hey, I got a question. Back sure. on wind power. Sure, um, absolutely. Is it does it seem like wind power is kind of losing momentum, at least in turn in terms of uh, budgets and contracts or? due to the reality setting in about the environmental harm and other problems or is wind power on the upswing wind power is definitely having its problems um i mean that's probably why biden even though he's promoting wind power actually did offshore oil leases in alaska because for fossil fuel because for drilling because it's actually now the economics are coming home and that's what sort of happens, that's one of the reasons, I mean, an electric utility isn't going to divest itself of its $625 million asset investment unless there's not a return coming. And some of the later information I'll share talks about how it just becomes uneconomic when you have to put up so many wind uh, turbines to generate electricity in the first place, and then you have to tie it to the grid, either in the, in the ocean or on land, and that in itself is a whole nother expense. So the challenge is that wind power, I mean, solar is not particularly economic either, and it would have died years ago without all the government um, rebates and incentives, and Solyndra, but wind is the same thing. Um, and it's very difficult. It's very expensive. They're having quality control issues. Some of the wind turbines are falling down and causing damage. So wind turbines are, I think, a good idea, but they're not really ready for prime time. And as more countries and companies start looking into it, they're like, wait, 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 can't do it. Not to mention when you have Holland pushing back on wind turbines um, because oh, they like point. their windmills, it's it's like, are you kidding me? And Holland, as we all know, is sort of green and le- left leading and environmentally you know, forward thinking. And they're like, we don't want any wind turbines in our country. I mean, it's oh, just sort wow. of amazing to me. Yeah. So I think the, the bloom is off the rose, so to speak, and the environmental yeah. issues just even make it even more uh, just another reason. But the reason I think that people aren't really are really pulling out wind power, I hate to say, isn't because of environmental issues. It's economic. If you can't make huh, money okay. off of it, or if it takes too much, if it costs too much to export the electricity to transport it to the grid, then how in the world is that a solution? Face it, John. Yeah, yeah. All of the decisions utilities, all of the decisions utilities make, or any business makes, are based on economics, right? And then we just think of ways to make it look palatable for a political yeah. reason, right? They should be, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Good answer. Right. No, thank you, John. Thank you for calling thank in. Thank you. I, 
I have yeah. some more fun stuff to share too. I do am scared that there's now giving personhood status to lagoons because what's next? Are we going to start giving personhood status to mountains? I mean, come on. Um, in my church on Sunday, we read the story of uh, Genesis and the creation. And, uh, you know, you don't have to be religious to say, uh, by the way, um, you know, in the story of Genesis, it was pretty clear that man was you know, supposed to take care of the earth and also be in charge of the earth and be good stewards of the earth, which we should be at, at all times, regardless of our religious affiliations. But I don't think that God made lagoons have the same personhood <laughs> as man. And I just kind of wonder where is this going to stop? Are we going to start granting personhood s- status, which means political power to other things? And are they going to start voting? Are we going to have the lagoon vote? It's just sort of an interesting um trend and it's not going to go i think it's going to increase uh then the other funny thing i found since we've been talking about oceans so to speak um with wind turbines offshore um they've actually done a study that they found scientists have now found that great that the green alternatives plastics that we're supposed to be using because plastics really bad um well actually the green alternatives to the throwaway plastics are supposed to be biodegradable but they're not they don't biodegrade grade in the ocean. They did an experiment and they actually found that they remained intact a year later, even though they're supposed to be biodegradable in the, in the ocean, you know, within a few months. And it adds to the existing evidence that only natural fibers degrade in the marine environment. So taking this one step further, um, they're basically this, this scientific group and research are hoping that consumers will be more aware that the plastics, even if they're considered biodegradable, really aren't, and we should get away from plastics entirely. And this uh, one, one professor said, customer, consumers who are concerned about microfiber plastic pollution should also be mindful of the other activities that they're buying, and we should all buy fewer garments, opt for high quality cellulose-based materials like cotton, merino, or wool, that will be, be more sustainable options, and do clothing swaps. So the logical extension of this argument is not only should we not use plastics, but we also should now make sure we're buying good quality cotton, fiber, uh, wool products, and then wear them for a long time and don't buy new clothes. There's actually a group that says run buy nothing groups in Europe. Why would you? So consumerism is, of course, causing this problem. But I never really thought that the green movement would start, start now start telling me what I have to wear and how I should wear it. It's becoming very Orwellian. I used to think it was just sort of silly, but now when I start thinking about all the different ways that these policies are intruding in our lives, I don't wanna sound paranoid, but it's a little scary. We're gonna be told what we can wear and how long we have to wear it. Um, You know, are we gonna be issued appropriate environmental clothing now or where are we going? Um, It's a scary idea. Um, And then the other thing that just always, uh, always just, makes me and it makes me kind of giggle is that this cop 28 the president um is wikipedia wikipedia is accusing them of greenwashing it cop 28 is the uh, new uh environmental movement that's head by a sultan from um an oil rich nation well they've been actually they've been writing all the green uh articles in wikipedia about it they're causing them a greenwashing very interesting. Um, so you never really know, but I always think you need to know all of the facts, not just the ones that you hear about in 30 second sound bites. But I'm Dr. Katherine Johnson, your host on the Bold Brave TV network. You've been watching the KJ Show, and I'll be right back. What if there were a super tiny device that could diagnose the brain and is smaller than a single human hair? What if you could see inside the brain to help an epilepsy patient during surgery or to help the fight against Parkinson's disease? Dr. Patricia Broderick is proud to announce the Broderick Probe, a biomedical and electronic breakthrough. Imagine a probe to help with the understanding and potential cure of brain-related diseases. To learn more, listen live to the Easy Sense Radio Show with host Dr. Broderick. Wednesdays, 7 p.m. Eastern on the Bold Brave Media Network and TuneIn Radio. And to help support the Broderick Foundation, please go to Easy 
sixthsense.com and learn how, with your help, we can fight these horrific brain disorders. That's easysense.com to learn more and help support the Broderick Foundation. Author, radio show host, and coach, John M. Hawkins reveals strategies to help gain perspective, build confidence, find clarity, achieve goals. John M. Hawkins' new book, Coached to Greatness, unlock your full potential with limitless growth. Published by iUniverse, Hawkins reveals strategies to help readers accomplish more. He believes the book can coach them to greatness. Hawkins says that the best athletes get to the top of their sport with the help of coaches, mentors, and others. He shares guidance that helps readers reflect on what motivates them. We discover and assess their core values, philosophies, and competencies, find settings that allow them to be the most productive, and track their progress towards accomplishing goals. Listen to John Hawkins' My Strategy, Saturdays, 1 p.m. Eastern, on the BBM Global Network and TuneIn Radio. Hey, and welcome back to the KJ Show. I'm Dr. Katherine Johnson, your host on the Bold Brave TV Network. I am talking today about wind farms and wind turbines and blowing in the wind. And, and I also had a fun little comment from John about that, this, you know, renewable clothing used to be called hand-me-downs. I totally understand. And John does too, because he came from a very large family and I'm sure he had his fair share of hand-me-downs, but it is kind of interesting. But I want to talk a little bit about what John was getting at about what is the future of wind power and what, you know, where does it look, where do we think it's going? And actually it's facing a lot of different crises. First of all, they're facing a, a supply crunch and a part shortage caused by, of course, all the other issues that we've had with COVID and the pandemic and supply chain disasters and the ships that can unload, unload their cargo. Well, that has a ripple effect across the entire economy. So the development of wind farms has actually been a lot slower than they thought because they just can't get the parts. There have been shortages of parts and assembly capacity risks are holding back on the technology. This is according to the Global Wind Energy Council. Um, scaling up wind requires healthy industries and healthy industries require thriving markets. Yeah, except we're in the middle of a war in Ukraine and Russia. We're in the middle of a recession or they're almost a recession, right? Some sort of economic ch challenges. And now we have supply chain issues which are affecting the ability to build wind power. And not only do they have a supply problem, they are now actually starting to say that even though wind electricity generation has grown rapidly, it's still not enough. We need to have the International Energy Agency based in Paris says we need instead of having uh, 8,000 terawatt hours by 2030 in, in order to hit our net zero goals. Um, that's a lot of energy. And now with companies pulling out of it, where's it going? Where are you going to get the pressure to develop new wind turbines stalled amid cost pressures and logistical bottlenecks um, with only 77 gigawatts built. Now, a gigawatt is a part of a terawatt. I'm sorry, I don't know all the physics associated with it, but you need a lot of gigawatts to get to a terawatt. That much I do know, and we're not going to have it. We just don't have the capacity right now um, in Europe. But guess who is building wind farms? Guess who? China. China has been building the largest wind farm and it could build that could power 13 million homes. Funny, China doesn't seem to have the supply issues. Oh, maybe that's because where the supplies are coming from. China is planning the world's largest wind farm and it's, a, it's so big, it could actually uh, power all of Norway. Uh, it's in a city in the Gujan province and has released ambitious plants for a 43.3 gigawatt fat facility in the Taiwan Strait. Um, it'll be offering off of, uh, it's going to basically have 75 to 185 kilometers offshore and it'll be offering powerful wind turbines. Um, the turbines will be able to run between 43 and 49 percent of the time and the project will start before 2025. Okay, so they're going to build the world's largest wind farm off the coast in China, but it's still, even though it's windy, it's only going to work 43 to 49 percent of the time. 50%, that doesn't sound reliable to me. Call me silly. But also, it's also saying that China can do it but because they have the parts. The problem is, do we have enough wind capacity in the world? And the answer is, as of 2021, the total offshore capacity is now 830 gigawatts, but China accounts for half of that. 
So yes, wind turbines are being built, but they're not being built in places that benefit the Western world. And they're being built in places where they have the parts. Uh, it's also noted that um, China has installed more offshore wind generation than any other country in the last five years. Is anyone else worried about maybe maybe the reason China is building all these wind turbines is because they have the parts and they won't sell them to us or we can't get them? It seems, I don't know, a little scary to me. Um, and another problem is that they now started to look at a wind turbine in Norway that wanted to, you know, basically build an offshore turbine off the coast of Guernsey, which is near England. And they said, but in order for it to be an economic decision, in order for it to make economic sense, they'd have to install a hundred turbines, wind turbines, to generate enough electricity to make it affordable. I thought wind turbines were free. I thought the energy was free. I thought it was supposed to be an economic benefit, but apparently not. According to this uh, vice president of UK Renewables says the large scale wind farm makes the most sense economically, but the surplus energy. So it's going to generate too much energy. It would need to be sold to either the UK or France. And that means they can't find, they need to find a way to offload it because it'll generate too much electricity and it'll just go to waste. And unless they can figure out a way to transport it through the grid, it's going to, it's not going to be economical. So that means Guernsey won't take all of it. And you have to have a buyer at the rice price price level needs to be found because this is a, a, a you know, this asset is electricity. It's, it can store it, but not that long. And by the way, so you're generating all this electricity, but unless you have a market and people to buy the electricity and a way to connect the electricity back to the grid in Europe, it's going to go to waste, which means it's not an economic solution. Wind, and then the other problem that they're having is that wind turbines were originally thought that they were going to last a long time, like 30 years. Nope, they're actually failing faster than expected. And the wind turbines don't last as long and the cost is higher than they thought, especially when they start having to replace the wind turbines. So Texas is now accounting for a quarter of all their wind farms, but they're actually now passing laws because what's happened in other places that have promoted wind power like Hawaii in California, what happens is when the wind turbines go out, get out of commission, when they're no longer usable, they are abandoned at huge costs. They think it was going to be maybe a hundred thousand dollars to recycle them. Well, first they can't be recycled. And then it costs up to 400 to $500,000 to decommission them and take them, put them away properly. And there's not even landfills for them to be handled in. So now 60,000 wind turbines are operating and may double, but there's no place to dispose of them properly. And so it's no longer a cost effective option. And now some countries or some states are actually gonna require the operators to get rid of dispose of the wind turbines when they're no longer operable, rather than passing them on to the citizens, which is what they've done in Hawaii and California. So it sounds like a lot of things still need to be fixed in the wind power solution. And again, it's a good answer, it's not the answer, and we need it, but we need a lot of other things too. All righty, I'm Dr. Katherine Johnson. I'm your host on the Bull Brave TV network. You've been watching the KJ Show, and I'll come right back. Did you know that your beliefs create your entire reality, but it's the subconscious beliefs that do most of the creating? Belief Shifter and Life Coach Shiraz can help you identify those limiting beliefs and eliminate them, often in a single session. Like it was almost instant, like... I had relief right away. Creating better health, relationships, careers, and finances. Let Shiraz help you step out of safety and into awareness. Definitely something's happening. Uh, it's like a, a flow inside. You know, it feels good. Whether in person or online, Shiraz provides personal coaching, belief shifting. Visit Shiraz at energeticmagic.com or call 416-529-7429. Energetic Magic on the BBM Global Network, Tuesdays at 7 p.m. Eastern. Find your greater happiness. Be well, be aware, be magical. Are you struggling to care for elderly parents or a spouse? Do you wonder if being a caregiver is making you sick? Are you worried about taking time off work to care for elderly parents and balance work, life, and caregiving? 
Has caregiving become exhausting and emotionally draining? Are you an aging adult who wants to remain independent, but you're not sure how? I'm Pamela D. Wilson. Join me for the Caring Generation radio show for caregivers and aging adults, Wednesday evenings, 6 Pacific, 7 Mountain, 8 Central, and 9 Eastern, where I answer these questions and share tips for managing stress, family relationships, health, well-being, and more. Podcasts and transcripts of The Caring Generation are on my website, PamelaDWilson.com, plus my caregiving library, online caregiver support programs, and programs for corporations interested in supporting working caregivers. Help, hope, and support for caregivers is here on The Caring Generation and PamelaDWilson.com. And welcome back to The KJ Show. I'm Dr. Katherine Johnson, your host on the Bold Brave TV Network. And today I've been talking about wind power but i at this part of the show i always like to talk about something a little fun and i had i haven't been talking about my favorite animals the beavers in a while so i wanted to give a beaver update um so we have a couple wildlife updates actually which seems appropriate since we are worried about the birds and the bats and the fish and the and the whales uh, being affected by wind power but guess what beavers have been brought back from the edge of extinction in london and now they're a protected species now i don't have a problem protecting beavers are making endangered species. I think that's right. What that's probably what we should do rather than giving them personhood. But the beavers are now a protected England species in England after four year, four hundred years after they were nearly hunted to extinction, and it's now illegal to kill, capture, or injure beavers. And they call them ecosystem engineers. I just call them the Swiss Army knife of animals um, because they're basically saying if you hurt a beaver, you're in trouble, and we don't want to hurt our beavers. We love our beavers. But changing the legal status of beavers is a game changer for these amazing eco engineers who benefit wildlife and people. And, um, and they've actually started to reintroduce them. And it now uh, people are so excited that beavers are coming back to England that they're actually going to have beaver safaris in London. Londoners will be able to see the beaver safaris to see the animals in the wild where the pairs are settled. They're going to have organizations in charge of rewilding the beavers will run beaver safaris. So catch so they can see the beavers in the morning and the evening and the findings and they show that the beavers have reduced flood flows by up to 60% re rewilding is a crucial tool in the toolbox for tackling climate and nature emergencies and beavers can do much of that rewilding free of charge in rivers and wetland environments. I'm all for the beavers go beavers. Um, and so England has finally done what California was doing a few months or a few months ago and actually realizing that beavers are essential to our climate protection strategies. Um, and maybe going back to Alaska isn't such a bad thing. And then I'm a French Francophile, right? People know that I'm, I love France and I spent six weeks there and it's really fun. But apparently the French being French, well, there's some tensions between the city slickers and the rural farmers. So this one guy, a, a, new, a neighbor, basically sued his farmer for because his rooster, Maurice, was continuing. He got up in the morning and cro cocked and crowed because that's what roosters do. They don't just do it in the morning, by the way. They do it pretty much all day long. And so there's a big battle between rural France and the urbanization of France. So the French court has ruled that a rooster called Maurice can continue his dawn crowing despite complaints from the neighbor. And the Maurice has lived for four years on a little island off the coast of France. And but his new neighbor, a retired businessman, says he bought a second home and then he was really mad because there was a rooster living nearby. But the roosters won. Maurice won the plaintiffs and, the, and now they have to pay uh, the neighbor. The neighbor who, has, who, who sued Maurice uh, has, owes a thousand pounds, euros in damages. The case has become a symbol of the tensions between the old rural way of life and the modern values. Today, Maurice has won a battle for the whole of France, said the lawyer who represented Maurice and his owners. Um, Maurice's case underscores decades long tension in France around city dwellers who buy city home, summer homes in the countryside without being ready to cope with the realities of rural life, animal noise, odors and insects. Yeah, and I used to live in a little rural town. In fact, it's featured in my novel Grit and Granite. Yeah, we had things called manure and we had all kinds of things. Rural life, you know, even though they're putting all the wind farms out there and in a few episodes, I'll talk about they're putting nuclear power plants back out there, too. It is different. And but you can, how how dare they think that you can uh, prevail over roosters? And I can tell you, the French take their wildlife and their conservation and their animals very, very seriously. The food in France is really delicious. And it's because I think the animals are so well cared for. 
they develop the local um, scene of eating it. And they actually are very proud of their roosters and they're very proud of their way of French life. And I'm glad that they're standing up to these city dwellers who are coming in and saying, we have roosters. Well, yeah, you're in the country. What do you expect? That's how we have, that's one of the ways we get, you know, helps us to get eggs. So I'm glad that Maurice represents the, the old rural France and the goodness, the court has done the right thing. So as far as we, you know, as much as we advance in the world, we still need to understand that the animals are really there um, to help us. And frankly, I think they're doing a lot better job than we are in some of these areas. So I'm really pleased that the roosters win and how ironic because the rooster is a symbol of, of France as well. So I'm the Dr. Katherine Johnson. I've been watching the KJ show and the Bald Brave TV network. I hope you enjoyed it and please join us next time and I'll continue our interesting conversations about energy and po policies and paradoxes. Have a great day. This has been The KJ Show. Tune in next week as Catherine shares her insights to current changes in the energy industry while drawing on her experience as an energy efficiency consultant for the past 30 years. Right here on The KJ Show.